tuned into the COVID night. We did stop. You were tuned in. You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, June 23rd, and it happens to be the 25th episode of this here radio show. I'm sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this show airs live Tuesdays at noon and repeats at 5 p.m. and also on Sundays. And you can listen online anytime at kdrt.org. My guests today are Lois Richter, host of That's Life and co-host of the Davis Garden Show on KDRT, and Don Shore, host of Jazz After Dark and co-host of the Davis Garden Show on KDRT. And no, they are not appearing together. Um, Back-to-back interviews, Don is also the owner of Redwood Barn Nursery. We're going to talk about how quarantine has impacted them both personally and professionally. We are at 100 days since shelter in place was first implemented. And uh, it's been a while since I've shared some COVID numbers. And it was kind of startling to look at the numbers yesterday and look at them again this morning and realize how much they're shooting up. Part of that, of course, is due to testing. But unfortunately, the deaths are not attributable to testing. Nationally, the CDC reports 2,275,645 confirmed cases and 119,923 deaths. In California, the Department of Public Health reports 178,054 cases, 5,515 deaths. And uh, by the way, that's an increase of 4,230 new cases over the previous day. And in Yolo County, public health reports 347 cases and 24 deaths, and that's 17 new cases over yesterday. This is not over, folks. Over the weekend, the CDC reported more than 30,000 coronavirus cases, the highest daily total since May 1st. New cases across the country are rapidly surging, especially in the South, the Midwest, and Western states, and officials are warning of clusters of infections among young people who are crowding bars and parties, with the highest rate of new infection among the 18 to 49-year-old population. The surge in cases comes as many states are pursuing reopening due to economic concerns, and the CDC is projecting deaths of up to 145,000 by July 11th. Locally, Yolo Public Health announced changes to its COVID-19 dashboard, which can be found at yolocounty.org. Now, winters and the unincorporated areas are separated to each have their own filter-by-area location on the dashboard. And with the increase of confirmed cases in the last two weeks, the county says it's making this change to better coordinate and direct public outreach and education on the pervasiveness of COVID-19. In addition to the county's website, which features links to all COVID-19 related info on the front page, residents can also call YOLO 211 for resource information, and you can also search YOLO County on Facebook and Twitter. And finally, last week I mentioned Davis Downtown Business Association's sponsorship of the Davis Downtown Communal Art Project, which called for artists of all ages to participate in a community-wide art project focused on how we've all been coping with shelter in place and social distancing. So the deadline has passed, the art is in, and the voting is open. So you are cordially invited to like all your favorites on the Davis Downtown Facebook page, and I believe that is where all the voting is taking place, not on their website. We're going to take a moment for music, and we'll be back with our first interview. As I mentioned earlier, Lois Richter is host of That's Life and co-host of the Davis Garden Show on KDRT, but she's also a talented artist and so much more. Here to chat with us about her own COVID-19 disruption and adaptation is the one, the only, Lois Richter. Welcome, Lois. Well, hello, Autumn. I'm so glad to be here. Good Usually to... I'm interviewing you. I know, I know. I was thinking about that, the uh, the shoes on the other foot now, so to speak. How are How are you doing? We're doing fine. Good. My husband and I have been home for, what, three months or so? Yeah. And very seldom going out, an occasional doctor's appointment or the 6 a.m. Nugget Market senior <laughs> uh, 
time to right. go shopping once a month or so. Right. But other than that, I'm I am mostly just here. Mm. Well, good to hear that you're you're keeping well. So, as you know, I've been talking to all kinds of people about their experiences and and information they need to convey during this this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. And I was thinking about you. You are very involved in normal years with the Whole Earth Festival at UC Davis. You're also very mm-hmm. involved with the Davis Senior Center, and not to mention your involvement here at KDRT and Davis Media Access. So. If you can think back, what were your thoughts as everything started shutting down or, or being canceled? Well, we were heavy into preparations for the Whole Earth Festival, mm-hmm. which we, we start preparing in uh, December and January, and then it gets really busy in February and, and into March. And then all of a sudden, the university said, well, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so, oh, and then classes were canceled. Oh, um, most of the people who are involved with the Whole Earth Festival are students. Mm-hmm. And every year the student staff changes. I mean, some people carry over from year to year, but there's very few people with more than three years experience because it's undergrad. Right. And so that was a real difference, mostly because I was no longer communicating with the vendors who were planning to come and set up at the festival. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of of emails and and all that stuff and figuring out the math and all that stuff. Yeah. So all of a sudden, boom, it stopped. But the staff decided that they wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. And so they got together and they created a virtual Whole Earth Festival. And I didn't have to do anything about that because there was no no craftspeople to coordinate. So I just got to watch them do their thing, and and that was it was it was inspiring yeah. to see how much they were able to carry on and do, even though we couldn't meet in person, and the festival didn't happen in person. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was sad yeah. because there's a lot of people who are who are friends who've been coming to that for a long time. It started in 1970, and um, you know I've been. I've been working on it for over 20 years, so um, that was sad. Yeah, that's the but, first one I haven't attended since 1985, by the way. So yeah, a, lot, a lot of us yeah. have real history with it. Well, they did the, the virtual WEF was held on a, a thing called Twitch, mm-hmm. which is a streaming site, and there were four channels, and it was all, you know. But some of the things that happened there are also available on YouTube. So right. if you went to Facebook and you looked for the Whole Earth Festival and you followed the links there, you could probably find some of the stuff that happened mm-hmm. that day. It was on the the Saturday that would have been festival weekend. Right, right. So that was a big one. Yeah. But the more, the even bigger one for me was when the senior center uh, shut down. Mm-hmm. And that's because... I participate in an exercise class there called Fit for Life. It's Debbie Ernesty, who is, by the way, the best (laughs) physical trainer person thingy. She's so good. And she takes care of us so well. And she she studies senior uh, bodies. And she's just great. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we couldn't see her. So we went from three times a week exercising to nada. Right. And it took a, a, a few weeks, but she did uh, figure out how to create an exercise program and have it online. And so we were one of the first ones to do the Zoom thing. Mm-hmm. And now there are uh, three times a week there's exercise program. In fact, she expanded it so she now has morning one and she has an afternoon one. Um, it's great. That's, it's really great. Yeah. In fact, I think I like the Zoom exercise better than the in-person exercise as far as the exercise program goes because I can see her all the time right right and Whereas it's convenient in the other place you're in the room and and you know you're you can't see really well yeah so. y- you've also done a lot of things at the senior center over the years including genealogy oh, yeah. classes and and uh, art classes and art exhibits and so I, I know that's been a real uh, central place in your life yeah, yeah. and I can't go there anymore it's, right. it's, I can't go there anymore. And, so. and at the moment, you can't come here either. And I, I do want to talk about KDRT with you. So you do two shows. How, how many years has it been that you and Don Shore have produced the Davis Garden Show on KDRT? 
how many years has the station been open? Uh, 15. Uh, 16 uh, 15. this fall. 16 this fall. You started at the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, yeah. And and then I started doing my show, too. So, uh, and that was within within a few months. So. And these are, in, in most times, these are weekly shows. So that's a real commitment to plan the contact. Uh, the, the guests to have the the conversations um, and and to prepare. So what well, what you well, and Don? Yes and, go ahead. Yes and no, because for the Davis Garden Show, Don Shore is the plant expert, right? And so he takes care of what questions, what topics. I mean, I bring may bring in a question now and then, but mostly I'm there as the second voice and the the person to chat with. But he's the one who's who's leading that Mm -hmm. now for my own show of course i i usually have a guest and i'll call someone up or have someone in the in the station and and that's changed but i don't actually do a lot of preparation i find the guest i get them to agree to be there and then we just sit down and talk (laughs) so i'm not one who has to do a lot of work on my show which has actually been a blessing because when i for the five years that i was dealing with my mom i didn't have I could continue to do the show, and it was okay. Yeah. So yeah. in this situation, it took me a while to figure out how to do something. And so I did a, 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 just a couple of weeks ago I started, and I did some, some music shows. Now I'm doing interview shows over Zoom. Um, I I'm, I'm, think I'm up to speed. I'm having a great time. Oh, good. So uh, tell us about your most recent episode of That's Life or one that's upcoming. Well, the one that's going to be played on Thursday was an interview I did with Bob Bowen. Hmm. Now, he is a City of Davis employee. He's the public relations head, and he's a historian in Davis, too. And so we started talking about what is what is happening to businesses in Davis. What are some of the possibilities, some of the plans, some of the restrictions? And we talked about that for a while. And and as we're going along, he's also bringing in the the historical things you know well this building used to be this and now it's that and now everything and so it, that was interesting and then some of the new stuff that's happening like uh, the new restrooms mm-hmm. uh, some of the art projects and then just personal stuff about about him and about davis and it, it was fun to talk to him but then editing up that program into a radio show that took a lot longer normally i, I used to i just i'd sit down We'd be on the air for an hour. That was it. I'm done. Yeah. But now you do the interview for an hour, and you better have another extra 10 minutes just in case. <laughs> and then you have to edit, and that takes hours and hours and hours to do. Mm. So it's a lot hard. I'm spending a lot more time on yeah. catered stuff than yeah. I ever did. Because when we went in, we'd just go in. We wouldn't see anybody else working there. I mean, you'd say hi to you or hi to Jeff or something. But yeah. it wasn't like we were... We weren't socializing. We weren't in the office. We just went in and did the shows and left. Right. So it's um, that one hasn't has been as, as huge a change as the other things. And then, of course, I'm a Quaker, so we can't go to the Quaker meeting house and have meeting anymore. Mm-hmm. So our meeting for worship is by Zoom. And I always thought that was hysterical, a silent meeting <laughs> on Zoom. But it works out okay because you can see people and and chat afterwards and and but it's changed you right. can't give people a hug you can't share food um life is very different so. these days i was going to say it's a good thing that you know you're you're very good um with computers and the last que- my last question for you is i i saw somewhere that you're now offering zoom coaching for others so what does that look like yes that um i, I had never heard of zoom until all this stuff shut down mm-hmm. and then when i was helping debbie uh, figure out how to get her class going we tried a few different things and zoom seemed to work well and so then i you know you know me as soon as i i have a problem i i read as much as i can i learn as much as i can i try to to get to a point where i can translate from jargon into human and so with debbie's class which is all seniors mm-hmm. uh, there were a lot of folks who were not well I guess computer literate is not quite the right term anymore, but they weren't really, um, they're having trouble getting the Zoom to work. And so I ended up doing quite a few sessions of training 
for them, for the genealogy club, a lot of individuals helping them get on and things like that. I recorded a basic training. I haven't published it yet, but um, yes, I am available for giving private tutoring as well. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you for making time to chat and and letting me turn the tables on you because, as you noted, you have interviewed me many <laughs> times over the years. So this was oh, kind of yeah. this was kind of yeah. fun to hear from you, and uh, I look forward to the time someday when I can see you in person again. Well, there is always opportunities. For example, one could go birding with someone else staying 10 feet apart, and still have a really good time. This is true. This is true. All right. Lois Richter, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We're going to listen to music for just a minute before we take our next call. All right. My next guest is Don Shore. Don is the other half of the Davis Garden Show, but he's also the host of Jazz After Dark here on KDRT. And he is the owner of Redwood Barn Nursery, which is adjacent to the DMA building. So, hey, Don, how are you doing today? Doing well. Feels like spring is never going to end. Well, it's summer now, I I hate to tell you. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks so much for coming on today. Um, I've I've known you for a long time, but I don't actually know the story of how you Mm. got into radio. And I think it predates Cater. Is that true? Correct. I used to drive across the Yellow Causeway to sit in with and then for Dan Pratt on KFBK, who does a major garden show there. And did that first in 1989. And so, uh, and then was his regular fill in host whenever he was traveling, all the way into the early and mid 1990s. Right. And I also sit in with the, the gentleman who replaced him, Fred Hoffman, okay. Farmer Fred, who does that show as well as another one on KSTE. Okay. I've seen you sometimes on Facebook reference that you're on the air yeah. with Farmer Fred. You and get I, growing I, with Farmer Fred. Yeah. 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 And then, as Lois just mentioned, the Davis mm-hmm. Garden Show started. It was one of the earliest shows on KDRT. That's right. Lois had a TV show, uh-huh. uh, and I would be an occasional guest on that. We'd chat about gardening things. And along came this little radio station, KDRT, K-Dirt. I mean, got to have a garden show on there. <laughs> and so she and I jumped in right from the start. I'm pretty sure that was 2005 that we did the very first broadcast of the Davis Garden Show. Right. And with one or two missed uh, each year, you know, for holidays, we've done about 50 per year since 2005. That's a lot of content. It is, and you can find it at davisgardenshow.com. They're all (laughs) archived there. They're all saved. All right. And then uh, Jazz After Dark is your wildly popular. People love jazz, and you have listeners in other countries. You have listeners all over the place. Jazz fans are nuts, and they're all over the world. (laughs) We love them. Yes, it is fun to do that show because we do get comments from Australia and a gentleman who listens to us in Tokyo and so forth. This little tiny radio station is broadcasting jazz all over. Right. George Moore had been uh, doing jazz here for a long time, and uh, he was retiring from that, and so I decided to go ahead and step in in... 2010, I think it was, and uh, have done it ever since. And because of the style of his show, I kind of stuck to and prefer what I call 20th century jazz. Yeah. Jazz that you're more familiar with and comfortable with, not esoteric, abstract kind of stuff that, you know, is more, more um, what jazz critics like. I like to do jazz for everybody. Right. And it's fun to do. It's a great show. I enjoy doing it. And in normal times, you bring your little dog, Scout, and mm-hmm. you come in here. And yep, the my, show airs Tuesdays at 8 p.m. My you come co-po- in here. co-host, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you do your show. And as Lois just said, you're producing from home. So yeah. what's that process been like for you? Her comment is correct. It takes longer, even though it seems like it would be simpler, although you don't have to do it all at once. In, in the past, you could walk over, your show's ready, you're on the air. 58 minutes later, you're done, it's in the can, and you can go away. Now you sit there and you put it together using Audacity and using Audio Hijack and various forms of software. You can do it much more smoothly and you can do it over time, but she is correct that we fiddle with it a lot. We go back in, we're we're realizing we're at 56 minutes instead of 58 and you can't have dead air. So you have to, you know, pad that out. It it takes longer, but as you get faster, as you do it more, you get faster at it. And it actually is kind of fun to do. So and and you're doing it. That's yep. the thing. You've yep. accomplished yep. that task. Original so. content is on the air for Jazz After Dark and Davis Garden Show, right. which has been a different exercise in Zoom. Yeah. Well, we th- we thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so Redwood Barn Nursery. I I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but I remember the first time I met you. Mm-hmm. I started working here at, at well, we were then called Davis Community Television. I'm going to say it was the at the end of 1996. It's been a very very long time. <laughs> Ooh. Are we showing our age? Yes. And. <laughs> 
someone, I forget who, told me I was setting up for a show. You have to go over to the nursery and you have to tell Don you're borrowing plants. Mm -hmm. So I walked in, never met you, and, and said, I need to borrow plants. And you gave me a strange look, but you said, oh. And I said, DCTV? Oh, okay. You're yep. all right. You're okay. You pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so we've yeah. worked kind of next to each for other. For years and years oh. of shows at DCTV, borrowed yeah. plants to for the stage oh, set. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. 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 We opened in 1981. So at the time we opened, we were literally on the edge of town. This building that, that the station is in had just been built basically right. the same year. Yeah, I do remember when the, the post office at the corner yeah. of uh, Fifth and Pole Line was, was the absolute edge of town. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's no longer the case. So uh, in Yolo County, nurseries are considered essential businesses. Yes. And that is because? Uh, it was interesting. I woke up one morning to find that six uh, health commissioners in the Bay Area had closed all businesses. My friends in the nursery business were shut down, ordered to send their workers home, and they were closed for the indefinite future. So we promptly, as did they, contacted the county health officer to say, is there any context in which we are an essential business? In Yolo County, the health officer's immediate reply was, you're agricultural. You help people grow food. And so on that basis, we were considered, considered essential. Uh, home do-it-yourself stores, home improvement stores, were also eventually or fairly shortly thereafter considered essential, and we fit in that category. Yeah. Things that people do at home to keep their houses and yards in order. So in both those categories, garden centers, nurseries were considered essential. Don't mess with ag in Yolo County. That's no. all I'm saying. <laughs> no, and the nurseries in the Bay Area had to jump through a lot more hoops. Right. We did, of course, since we remained open, have to completely change the way we did business. Right. And not only making it obviously safe for our staff and for people who did come in, which was very few people at that point, yeah. but uh, we had to go to a delivery mode. We became the Amazon of the garden business <laughs> in the local area. We did 18 deliveries one day. I remember that. 10 yeah. to 12 was typical. 40 to 60 emails a day. 50 to 100 phone calls a day. 10 to 12 deliveries every single day, seven days a week, because everyone was at home. Yeah. And we wanted, as I said, we want to help you garden. And it, it's been, I've, as you know, I've come he here to the DMA building a couple times a week during this mm -hmm. whole process. It's been very easy to see how busy you are. Yeah. You're, you're crowded some days. Uh, now, in Yolo County, the onus is on businesses to enforce the mask law. So, yes, it is. So yes, it is. what's that like on a daily basis? People are, are overwhelmingly in compliance here by comparison with other communities. So that's been very fortunate. We've had a little pushback on it. I'm happy that it's the law because I can simply say that. There, there are counties where it wasn't and where business owners were having to try and do it on a voluntary basis. Right. They got pushback. We've had a few people grumble about it. I get to hear everybody's opinion about it. That's fine. They walk in if they don't have <laughs> Have a mask. I have a few that I bought from the Davis Phoenix Coalition, so I can hand them and say, "Here you go. Wear this with pride," and uh, <laughs> they're happy with that. Only one or two people have been really problematic about it. Social distancing has been a little more challenging. Six feet apart is hard to maintain when you're crowding in to grab that one tomato plant, yeah. and we have to keep reminding people and lots of signage out there. But it is a safe place to shop. Garden centers have the advantage being fairly open and lots of room. Right. Um, but it, it is something we have to keep on people about a little bit. I made myself promise I'm not going to ask you about tomatoes. Is it time to plant tomatoes? When <laughs> is it time? Because I know you get that question. Mm -hmm. You've told me you get that question incessantly. From Year a, round. From about February <laughs> yes. 1st on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I will say this. Uh, most of us in the, in the nursery industry were completely unprepared for what happened next, which was literally a tidal wave. Of, oh, excuse me, metaphorically, a tidal wave yeah. of demand for vegetable plants. Everybody who even who had never gardened before, people who were casual gardeners, and of course the serious gardeners, everybody planted a vegetable garden this year. And you've been talking about the concept of victory gardens. In fact, yeah. you, wrote, you wrote one of your enterprise columns mm -hmm. on it recently. So uh, for those of you who, who may not know, back during the, uh, I guess it was the period of World, World War II, War II yeah. uh, people were encouraged to plant victory gardens. Sure. Um, it was a catchy name, but the, the point was with fears of disruption in the food supply chain, everyone right. could have at least their own source of food. Right. Americans are not accustomed to walking into the store and seeing no chicken, which happened to me a couple times. Right. You know, So people did get – it was a little panicky. It was also people just seeking – uh, what I call agency over their own food supply. Mm -hmm. uh, we've always had that, but we are accustomed to that happening in times of economic slowdown and uptick in vegetable sales. This was an overwhelming demand, mm -hmm. and it actually affected the supply chains all the way back to the seed vendors, the bag goods suppliers. There were some really serious shortages for about two to four weeks. Good news, you can always plant another crop. So the growers did catch up. 
but there was an amazing demand in April and into May and really still continuing, actually. And has the supply chain, had the issues there kind of leveled out? Uh, with the plants, yes. Seeds, no. Bag goods, sort of. So that's where we are. We have no manure. What a terrible problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> There's a manure shortage in Yolo County. <laughs> because cows aren't. The cows are still breeding. producing it. It's getting it into the bags. It's the problem. <laughs> so, right. If yeah. you can't run a facility and you can't have workers, then I could see where that would be a problem. That was the first issue was the growers and the baggers were also told to send their employees home. So they were yeah. quickly working with skeleton crews. And so it's been an interesting spring, to put it mildly. Yeah. Right. Well, um, let, let's go back to talking about Jazz After Dark. For, mm-hmm. We have just a couple of minutes. So it airs tonight at 8, as I Correct. said. Correct. Tuesdays at 8 p.m. What's, what's on tap? Uh, coming up tonight on Jazz After Dark, there will be some early Ella Fitzgerald, Les Paul, Gigi Grice, Art Farmer, Toots Silliman's, I love the names in jazz, Chet Baker, Zoot Sims, Houston Person, and Tito Puente with Oya Como Va tonight on Jazz After Dark. Sounds good. It's always a fun ride. I do want to tell you that I, I get interesting mail because of you, too. I got a, <laughs> a really sweet card from a woman in Austin, Texas last week who said, I, all capital, I love Jazz After Dark. I listen from Austin every week. And, and, and again, that's typical. We and love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So if you are someone who enjoys um, Don's programs, thanks for tuning in to him. All right. I want to thank you very much yep. for stepping up and, and talking to us about your business and, and your music. And we wish you well. Great to talk to you, Adam. All thanks. Right. Thanks so much, Don. And to all of you, as I said, today was episode 25, which is hard for me to believe. I've interviewed almost 50 people. Uh, an average of of two interviews per episode over the last three months. And uh, it's been informative and kind of a wild ride. And I guess I'm going to keep doing this for a while. So thank you for tuning in from the KDRT studio. 